background, you might see a little black blur. <laughs> That's friendly. <laughs> so I guess we, um, looks like it's a good time to get started. Um, I just want to let everybody know this is being recorded um, before we start, and it'll be up for viewing um, through NEA New Hampshire later this week, but I just want to let you know that it is all being recorded. Um, so good evening, everyone. My name is Megan Tuttle. I'm the president for NEA New Hampshire. We have close to 17,000 members and we're the largest public employee union in the state. It's my honor to welcome you to tonight's discussion. Our students' job, as we all know, is to learn and our job is to make sure they can. It's clear to us that our democracy will flourish only when we ensure every school is fully funded, every child is treated with dignity, and every learner can pursue their passion. At the state and national level, we must pass laws and policies that push forward the arc of justice. Laws that protect all children's access to a great public education, regardless of age, background, need, or zip code. The only way we can make sure all learners have the tools and schools they need to succeed is to properly fund every aspect of public education. Yesterday, NEA New Hampshire testified against the first of many bills introduced this session designed to dismantle our public schools. We will continue to advocate loudly for students and educators, and we could certainly use your help. The first step is getting a solid understanding of the root causes of the problems and committing yourself to action to solve the crisis. Powerful, deeply conservative forces are determined to reroute funding for our public schools to unaccountable private and religious schools. Their efforts go by many names, but in the end, they're simply all voucher schemes. No matter how you look at it, vouchers undermine strong public education and student opportunity. They take already scarce funding from public schools, which serve 90% of the students, and give it to private schools, institutions that are not accountable to taxpayers. This means public school students have less access to music instruments, science equipment, uh, modern technology, textbooks, and after-school programs. And there is zero statistical significance that voucher programs improve overall student success. Some programs have even shown to have a negative effect for students receiving a voucher. Furthermore, vouchers have been shown to not support students with disabilities. They fail to protect the human and civil rights of students and they exaggerate segregation. Tonight, we're gonna to explore why the right is so fixated on dismantling public education in the United States with education historian Jack Schneider and journalist Jennifer, Jennifer Berkshire, authors of Wolf at the Schoolhouse Door. Our moderator for tonight's discussion is Representative Linda Tanner. Linda is a member of the House Education Committee and is currently in her third term in the New Hampshire House. She represents Cornish, Croydon, Grantham, Newport, Plainfield, Springfield, Sunapee, and Unity. Linda understands the demands of education as a former teacher and department chair at Kearsarge Regional High School. She retired in 2004 and, and is now, along with her role in the New Hampshire House, a faculty emeritus, varsity tennis coach, and adjunct professor at Colby Sawyer College in New London, New Hampshire. So really, she's not doing a lot for education in New Hampshire. She's <laughs> a few small things. So thank you for being with us tonight. Um, Representative Tanner, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you a lot, um, very much. And thank you to all the teachers out there that are trying to teach in this unusual, unusual times. I, I really can't give you enough credit. Um, you're doing a marvelous job in utter dire circumstances. I thought I'd start out talking to you a little bit about my history and the things I've been through as it parallels <clears throat> the book, uh, The Wolf at the Schoolhouse Door. Um, I started teaching in 1970. Uh, right as New Hampshire and the, and the nation was going through some really turbulent times. The Timberlane High School teachers were on strike and were in the longest strike, teacher strike in the nation. Uh, teachers were being fired if they were suspected of being gay. And <clears throat> there were even dress codes. Uh, I remember you, as a female teacher, you couldn't wear pants to work. Um, at the same time in New Hampshire, there was a real movement to attract teachers. They started offering retirement benefits and forming new modern schools by combining several towns into a district. And that's kind of how I end up at Kearsarge. It was an open concept school with few walls and teachers excited about the possibilities. My starting pay was $7,000 for the whole year. And most of us had to have second jobs to make ends meet. But we were collaborators on new curriculum scheduling setting the tone of a student-centered school. 
we were treated as valued professional educators. Soon through NEA negotiations that were both respectful and productive by both sides, we started getting better paying benefits. <clears throat> that lasted for about a decade. And then the whole environment, the whole scene started to change. As I looked back and read this book, I realized that we were experiencing what was the results of a wolf pack forming in the wild with a mission to attack us by overregulation, defunding, demeaning, and even disintegrating our public school system. Back then, a small but vocal group of members of a conservative group called Committee for the Excellence in Education started agitating at public hearings and school board meetings against teacher raises and benefits, new programs, and they fought to put up regular classroom walls in a school that didn't quite look like the school of their childhood. Little did we know, or I know, or realize at the time that we were part of a much larger agenda that was well-funded and had and continues to have many players in high places. Looking back, it was almost like being the proverbial frog in the pot of water about to boil. Soon we were going from one idea, new theory, new directive, new test, new teacher evaluation from federal and state level to the, <clears throat> to the next as the winds of politics changed. We filled out mountains of paperwork, this may sound familiar to many of you, attended nonstop meetings, were trained how to integrate and teach all types of special needs. We prepared students for high stakes testing, filled out more reports to go home, made duplicates of discipline referrals, helped students with more emotional and mental health issues, and dealt with the effect of income inequality, food insecurity, child neglect and abuse, and homelessness. Through all this, all I wanted to do was teach, coach, help kids be the best they could. I admit I was naive when I avoided being in politics. I still hear that same message I said from years and years ago, I hate politics. I was incredibly lucky to be able to retire early with a parachute meant to entice and jettison us older, higher paid staff. But teachers never retire. We have to do something, a cause or a fight. As I sat at home in retirement looking for something, I realized our state had started cutting kindergarten funding, special ed funding, building aid, teachers' retirement benefits, and much more. And all the time, charter schools were being pushed and expanded without oversight or basic requirements. I couldn't sit on the sidelines anymore and I jumped into the political game. I'm now actually on my fourth term as a state representative <clears throat> serving on the House Education Committee. I'm proud to be on this committee with fellow Democrats who have educa education expertise and who are deeply committed to public education. In our short term of 2020, our Democratic majority commissioned an independent study of school funding. Mel Myler, a name familiar to NEA, and David Luno deserve much credit for their hard work, which along with the results from the UNH Carsey School of Research, gives us some real data for our fight for proposing preserving public schools and fair funding. I have a front row seat to the destru destruction and deception spelled out in this book. There is a direct line from Betsy DeVos to Chris Sununu to Frank Edelblut. Our New Hampshire Department of Education is all about dismantling public schools while promoting and funding charters and vouchers. The wolves are on a systematic course of legislation that will diminish the need for certified educators. Anybody can teach. They will continue to put roadblocks for public schools to be successful and then label them as failing. Oversight and accountability for charter schools and schools receiving vouchers will be minimized or absent and meaningful certification for teachers and unions will be attacked. This year is an extremely critical year for us. The Republicans and their allies are being energized and directed by ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, Ed Choice, which is part of the Heritage Foundation, the Free State Movement, and the Religious School Movement to end public education as we know it. They have, com they have gained complete power in the New Hampshire House, the Senate, the Executive Council, and the Governor's Office. They can run the table. They are well-funded by national and local players. 
As this point, book points out, they have the marketing and the power to place our students' education into the open marketplace as a commodity, much like a car, for private profit, and to sell snake oil to parents who really don't have the last choice of schools, especially if your child needs services or you're a minority. The schools actually have that choice. We in education and our allies must have our eyes wide open and our pens and our voices ready. We must be willing to step up to the door and confront the wolf pack who are anti-government school and committed to a conservative and religious social culture war. I know these authors can open our eyes and give us direction. I have hope, hope that free taxpayer funded public education open to all children that walk through that schoolhouse door will survive and actually become stronger. So every child has the opportunity to reach their potential. So our democracy has a firm foundation and our communities will thrive. Now I'd like to introduce the authors <coughs> of Wolf at the Schoolhouse Door. We have two of them with us tonight. Uh, Jack Snyder, who is a, an assistant professor of education at UMass Lowell and leads the Beyond Test Scores Research Project. He's the author of four books. He writes frequently about education and outlets like The Atlantic and The Washington Post. And he is co-host of the Educational Policy Pod, Have You Heard, which is well worth your while to check out. Jennifer Berkshire writes about education and politics for the nation, The New Republic, The Baffler, and other publications. She's a creator and co-host of the Education Policy Podcast, Have You Heard? She teaches aspiring podcasters in the journalism program at Boston College and the labor studies program at UMass Amherst. A licensed public school teacher, Berkshire lives in Gloucester, Massachusetts. So authors, Jack and Jennifer, take it away. Thanks so much for having us. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, a shame, we, we've been doing uh, these events and virtually traveling all over the US, but this is one we actually could have come to in person. Uh, so a shame that we don't all get to be together tonight, but nice that we have this as an alternative at least. Um, in terms of offering an overview uh, of the book and um, kicking off a conversation about New Hampshire uh, and how some of these broader trends that we identify in the book maybe apply uh, to New Hampshire, um, I think I'll begin just by talking a little bit about the ideology that motivates this, trying to understand um, what's behind some of these policies that we have seen play out in various states, uh, including New Hampshire. Um, and then I'll turn it over to Jennifer, uh, who is not only up to date on what's going on in New Hampshire, but also in 49 other states, plus DC <laughs> and Puerto Rico. Uh, so, um, you know, this, this book began uh, essentially with a question, what, what's going on? Why are we seeing these zombie policies from the 80s suddenly coming back to life? Um, why are programs uh, like vouchers suddenly uh, energizing the right wing base in a way that they hadn't since, you know, Reagan's first year in office when vouchers were dead on arrival? Um, and as we began to dig into it, what we realized is that um, the Reagan revolution planted a lot of seeds that are really now beginning to bear fruit. And so in terms of thinking about some of the ideology that comes not out of the mainstream of the Republican Party, not from uh, sort of typical uh, conservative voters, but from the far right libertar libertarian oriented wing of the Republican Party, as well as those who are so far right uh, that it's hard to identify them. Um, and uh, what we began to see is that there are really four tenets of belief that are motivating activity in education. The first is that um, they value uh, the private over the public, uh, individuals over groups, and um, 
the ability to exercise one's individual freedoms, this should not come as a surprise to anybody uh, living in New Hampshire, um, the ability to exercise one's own personal freedoms over the other kinds of freedoms that we have in this country, right? Um, freedom from things, uh, freedom to things. Uh, so um, this obsession with private values um, couples really perfectly with this deep faith in markets, right? If you believe that we are all just individuals pursuing our own self-interest and competing against each other rather than working together uh, as you know, various concentric circles of community, um, moving from the local all the way out to the national, if you believe that we are in essence just individuals, um, looking out for ourselves, then the market actually is a pretty good way of allocating resources. Um, the market is a way to allow people to compete against each other. Um, and there is deep faith in markets over government, markets over community. Um, this idea that we are consumers rather than citizens. Uh, it motivates so much of what we see in terms of education policy. Empower parents to be consumers, right? Give them money loaded onto a debit card and let them go shopping for educational products rather than treating them like members of an educational community uh, who would come together to participate in the sort of democratic processes that have long been uh, at the bedrock of public education. Um, in addition to this faith in private values, the faith in markets, there's an obsession with cost cutting. Uh, and again, if we think about the way that these tenets of ideology um, reinforce each other, right? If you believe that we are all just individuals pursuing our own self-interest, then why would you want to pay for somebody else's education? Um, if you believe that the market uh, should settle everything, um, why would you believe uh, that, you know, you bear some responsibility for other members of your community? Um, let them pay for it themselves. Uh, the obsession with cost cutting um, should be particularly disturbing to educators since they account for about 80% of the cost of public education. Um, this is why uh, any effort to wring a profit out of education always fails unless it comes with an attack on teachers. There's no fat to trim, right? <laughs> you, you are what will be trimmed, right? And you are essential. Uh, and so you can see here that that leads naturally to a fourth uh, pillar of this ideology, which is a war on labor. Um, you have to make war on labor uh, in order to advance this ideology because Americans trust teachers. Um, in fact, three and a half million Americans are teachers. Um, teachers are essential to the process of education. And I don't just mean warm bodies in classrooms, right? We're talking about trained, experienced, full-time, decently compensated educators. Um, and that the reason we're talking about those kinds of educators is because that's what works best for children. That's what is at the heart of successful public schools. Um, and so if you look at these four pillars together, the war on labor, the effort to cut costs, the deep faith in markets and the obsession with the individual, suddenly all of these policies that can otherwise seem um, you know, incoherent as a package make sense because they each come from uh, this grounded uh, faith that again, um, is really not typical of uh, ordinary mainstream conservatives, but which has captured the Republican Party today um, and which has made tremendous strides in a number of states. Um, maybe now I'll kick it over to you, Jennifer, and you can talk a little bit about the policies. So um, we often get asked what inspired us to write the book. And for me, it was just trying to make sense of what I saw when I traveled around the country. And four years ago this month, I hit the ground, headed to Michigan to follow Betsy DeVos and try to make sense of her legacy in that state. And what I found was that, you know, over 30 years, her family and the conservative movement that they funded had, you know, had sort of set afloat this constant stream of policy initiatives aimed at undermining public education in that, in that state. And that it really was, it was a story about politics that their real goal was Republican forever rule, 
right? And that they saw weakening public education as a way of knocking out the teachers union, of weakening, uh, you know, weakening all the structures of democratic oversight and the things that they didn't like. It was about weakening the ability of the citizens of the state to demand things like better funded schools. So then I would come home and as Linda mentioned, I live just over the border from you in Gloucester, Mass. And I heard someone who sounded just like Betsy DeVos coming from New Hampshire. And I'm talking, of course, about your own Frank Edelblue. And I didn't know that's how you pronounce his name. I didn't realize the T was silent. I, I've learned that lesson. But again, it was the same thing where these policy initiatives that don't really make any sense on their own, when taken together, are always about undermining what he he refers to in such derogatory terms as the system and this was really like i started looking around at other states and i realized wow there are a whole bunch of these people like where where did this come from what you know where what what has caused it to really come to the surface now and so as much as the book was inspired by michigan it was also very much inspired by what i was seeing happening right across the border in new hampshire and also the you know how hard it was for teachers and union leaders to tell a story that made sense to people about why these policy initiatives that seemed um, either harmless or even, you know, like sometimes they sounded like a good idea, right? Like, why not let a whole bunch of other entities besides the school district give kids credit, right? Like, like that's the kind, it's kind of like when I run, run into people in my area and they say, why don't we run schools like a business, right? That like some of these things are kind of common sense and that you really have to figure out a way to push back against them. So I just wanna give you all a, a shout out and let you know what a big role New Hampshire played in this book. And we actually mentioned your commissioner of ed education a number of times. Well, thank you, uh, Jennifer. We have uh, some questions that we, we'd like um, you to address. And, uh, and I'll just put it out there and whichever of you feels the best to answer, um, please do. Um, what do you, now that uh, Betsy DeVos has left um, and we're, there's a little sigh of relief, I think at least, um, we don't wanna rest on our laurels and, and feel comfortable, but certainly not. We know that's not comfortable in New Hampshire. Uh, what changes do you expect, if any, coming down because she's no longer at the head? So I'll, I'll kick us off and then I want, I'm gonna give it back to Jack to talk about sort of the great unraveling that he's really good at talking about. Um, and obviously, you know, we're going through this tremendously difficult time right now with school reopenings. We have an episode of our podcast coming out tomorrow and I interviewed parents and teachers all over the country just to hear them talking about what's happening in their communities. And you can really hear these disturbing rifts opening up between people who need to be on the same side if we're actually going to be able to protect public education, right? And so you hear these disturbing stories. We're in a state like Kansas, um, where you had this incredible coalition of people who came together and pushed back against their very conservative state government and said, no, these, this level of cutting in our schools is intolerable. Right, and they really sort of kicked the bums out. And now you fast forward to today and that coalition is unraveling. So to the more positive note, what a difference it's already making that we have people who believe in public education occupying the bully pulpit. And I'm, I'm thinking not just of the nominee for Secretary of Education, Miguel Cardona, but also somebody like Joe Biden, who's such a powerful advocate for community colleges and the students who really like, they make their way through community colleges. How refreshing it's already proving to be, you know, just to have somebody who doesn't use that word system in such a derogatory way. And I'm gonna hand it over to Jack as a train rum rumbles by behind me. <laughs> um, yeah, well, you know, maybe I'll start with uh, the good news. So I was on a call with Becky Pringle uh, earlier today and um, she was, uh, wanting to talk about accountability um, because the Biden administration has reached out um, and is interested in thinking through, you know, what would a, a less dangerous 
less irresponsible form of educational accountability look like? That's, of course, how I would phrase it. I'm not sure that the Biden administration <laughs> put it that way, um, since they reauthorized NCLB as ESSA, uh, or at least yeah. you know Joe Biden was a part of um, that administration. Um, I think there's openness at the federal level right now um, to thinking about some of the deep underlying root causes of the challenges that we see in public education, right? Of um, making sure that uh, kids have a meal three times a day, right? That shouldn't be the responsibility of the school. And, and what we've learned from this pandemic, we've learned a lot. And one of the things is that um, schools are frontline agencies in terms of making sure that poor kids get something to eat every day. And I think a lot of Americans didn't know that uh, until now. Um, I think that a lot of Americans didn't know that schools are a warm, dry place for a lot of kids. Schools are a place where kids can access books and the internet. I mean, these basic, basic things um, that I think a lot of people simply didn't understand in terms of our collective unwillingness in this country to fully embrace the least advantaged. And so I see some openings here at the federal level for taking action to take care of our young people, particularly our youngest people, ages zero to five, uh, before they walk in and become kindergartners. Um, and I, I feel like that's, um, that's something that we are going to see happen over the next four years. A little bit less optimistically, um, we are seeing lots of activity at the state level, and we know that the federal government has very limited powers in education. Um, certainly they've, they've taken uh, you know, their limited powers uh, and stretched them uh, to their very limit uh, over the past couple decades. Um, but real power lies at the state level, even more so than at the local level, despite the fact that locals account for nationally on average uh, about 45% of the spending in the state, about 45% of the spending. Of course, it varies from place to place. Um, and at the state level, I think um, there's a lot to be worried about. Um, there's a lot to be worried about in terms of the assault on this idea of a public good, um, this idea that education is something that benefits all of us, even those of us who don't have kids. Um, it's something that strengthens communities. Um, instead, there is uh, this sort of steady forward march um, in about a third of our states right now, and it'll soon be about half, uh, to... Um, further atomize our society. And we've already seen this with COVID, right? We've seen the, t the tip of the iceberg with regard to what this looks like. Um, telling parents essentially, you know, um, you're going to be on your own, right? This is not what our schools have said to parents, but we've seen a sneak preview of the future where um, well-resourced parents uh, have gone and we know the pod phenomenon is a small phenomenon, but we saw this is what happens when you sever this link between community and education. And you instead say, um, you know, you're on your own. Uh, let's have the market uh, determine things. Use your own resources and we'll see how it all shakes out. Well, we know how it shakes out, right? We know that the least advantage will lose. Um, they lose anyway in our society, but they'll lose much more badly. Um, and so I, for me, the next four years are going to be about raising hell uh, at the state level in as many states as I can get my Zoom screen into um, in order to talk with uh, on the ground people. So these would be um, organized labor, other teachers, parents, community members, students themselves who can be tremendous advocates for their own education um, to talk about how do we restore public education as something broader than just this effort to build human capital? How do we restore our collective belief in the importance of public education as something more than just um, something we use to, to get ahead, to get into an elite college, those of us uh, who are already at the top of the socioeconomic hierarchy, um, something uh, that actually strengthens our democracy, that strengthens our communities, and that creates uh, racial and economic equity. Thank you. And, and, you know, with the pandemic and people having to teach at home, I think the phrase anyone can teach is kind of taken a beating as well. <clears throat> um, certainly from what I've heard, you know, it, it 
was always a, a joke amongst the teachers that we should have negotiated our contract the last week in August when all the parents had had the kids home all summer long. Um, I think it's going to be the same way with the pandemic, but um, what do you think educators should expect as we slowly pivot away from the pandemic um, learning in the future? You kind we of did, to a little bit. We did a, um, a session this morning with pastors from Texas which was great. And we talked a little bit about the whole debate about learning loss and how worried we are that the, you can really hear the sort of voices gathering, uh, gathering strength out there to start focusing on how we can uh, close the gaps of the kids who lost the most. And that's going to mean, if we're operating under the logic of the current accountability framework, that's going to mean uh, focusing on English and math. And it's going to mean that they essentially get a punitive response to the experience they just went through while they're more affluent peers who had the benefit of, you know, a big house with multiple internet connections, outdoor space, are sort of free to move about the cabin, right? Um, so we just talked about the fact that, like, this is at once an opportunity for us to raise our voices and say, no, this is unacceptable, right? That what these, what these students have been through was traumatic. And we saw for ourselves how much they need. Um, so this is an opportunity for us to, to finally deliver on that promise and not make it about uh, closing a gap in test scores and making school, frankly, even more miserable for a lot of kids that, you know, we've, that's been a wake up call for us too, right? That the, for a lot of kids, the way school is currently structured, especially in an era of pretty brutal accountability, is not pleasant. So the idea that we would finally be able to get them back into school only to double down on the things that they dislike is, I think, a terrible idea. Jack, what say you? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think that another thing that we can expect is uh, a, um, a less than overt effort uh, to cut costs um, and to um, deprofessionalize teaching. Uh, you know, I, I, I hate to say this uh, to teachers who, you know, have a lot of stress that they're managing already, um, but I think we need to be realistic as we think about um, the budgetary constraints that states are going to be facing um, for, you know, at least the next five years. Um, and I think the less dire news there is that um, if parents and community members are fully aware of what their state budget is and what proposed cuts to education are, um, that they will prioritize schools over almost everything else. But um, the, there are ideologically motivated politicians who would absolutely like to use this moment as an opportunity. I mean, we've already heard it plenty of times, and it's not just from conservatives, it's also from neoliberal Democrats um, who have talked about um, the quote unquote new, new normal. This is not the new normal, right? This is the new awful now for right now. And then we will return to the old normal, right? This pandemic is not the new world that we live in, and nobody should try to convince anybody that it is. If they are, they're opportunists who are trying to push something that people wouldn't go along with unless they somehow were scared into thinking that they had to. Um, so, you know, I think that one thing that we can expect, one thing that educators should expect as we begin to pivot away from the pandemic is an effort by opportunistic politicians um, to try to make cuts to public education, to try to deprofessionalize teaching again, tying this back to their longstanding obsession with cutting costs and making war on organized labor. And it's not just making war on organized labor because you all constitute 80% of the cost of education. It's because you're the best advocates for public schools and for young people, right? You're organized and parents aren't. Um, you know, parent, parents often um, look to teachers for 
the kinds of activism that they themselves feel incapable of engaging in because um, they just they, they haven't been organized in the same way as you all other than an occasional you know astroturf walton funded effort to get a, a token number of parents together to demand charter schools or vouchers right um, and that's not real parent organizing um, and so I think that uh, the more that educators can be ready for this fight, um, the more that they can be connected to families and communities, um, and the more that they can begin connecting to uh, their state legislators, um, uh, I think it is not ironic uh, that this call has been structured in this way uh, with these participants, right? Um, your, your allies and advocates uh, in state government working together with you um, and with your communities. Um, I think that's how you push back against it, but, but you know, I would, I would expect a fight. Um, thank you for that. Um, I know from my standpoint as a legislator, um, there's a group in Concord called Kent Street Coalition, and they've been very active in the halls when we met down there in real person. Uh, holding posters and sending postcards to us saying they're behind us and um, it meant a lot when you're in in the trenches fighting I think that's really important but it really needs uh, a big group of people getting together I think you're right on Jack with that and I think your next book should be a wolf in sheep's clothing uh, <laughs> at the schoolhouse door um, because it seems to me that th what they're doing now for their marketing is they're taking the ideas we have, um, like innovation in school, and tagging it on to the bill that just came up, which is called the Innovation School, which is essentially taking a public school and breaking it up into multiple charters. Uh, and then nobody has to be certified and you know the whole nine yards. So um, if we ever have a chance to actually promote policy, uh, which hopefully when the Democrats win back the majority, we will, what would you like to see happen at a policy level, both here in New Hampshire and probably more likely at the, at the national level, level um, in the next couple of Well, let's talk about New Hampshire because that's where you are. And um, I don't know if anyone has followed education policy debates in Massachusetts, but we actually had a huge win last year with respect to school funding. And the reason that that happened was that it became a genuine grassroots cause. And it tapped into something that I didn't expect that I would see. And that was that people in very well-resourced communities are deeply troubled by the fact that there are kids who live just a few miles away, because Massachusetts is a very compact state, who are supposed to get by with much less. They know this is wrong. And so we actually saw that this campaign it, it developed real legs. And as a result, it pushed our legislators to act and even now in the throes of the pandemic and the economic uncertainty that it's ushered in, there's still a lot of uh, pressure on our Republican governor to make sure that that's fully funded. So I know I have followed the debate in New Hampshire about school funding. I've, I even subscribe to some email lists, which just shows you how the kind of life that I lead. Um, <laughs> so, you, you know, your school funding situation is outrageous. And the fact that there's no acknowledgement of that from your, from the Republicans. And instead, the idea is that you would just start, you know, draining resources away and giving money to parents to basically spend on whatever they want with no accountability or oversight as part of the design of the program. Like that to me just seems outrageous. So I really hope that you guys will be able to push back and get school funding um, uh, back on the agenda. And the other thing I would say, I started out writing about education because I was chronicling what happened in Massachusetts during a state takeover and of a school district. And I saw that there was this huge gap between what people who had designed the school, the takeover were promising, basically higher test scores, uh, higher graduation rates, and what people in the community actually wanted. And I feel like if we, public education advocates and union people, could be more effective spokespeople for that bigger vision, we would have a much 
stronger chance of actually impacting policy as opposed to just, you know, like right now it's kind of hard to believe like you're up against it in New Hampshire, right? Like the best we seem to be able to talk about is just fending off the worst of these attacks. But what if our, what if we could actually come up with a broad policy vision that was driven by what people at the grassroots want? And it would include people in urban communities in, in New Hampshire, but also your rural folks for whom schools are foundational community institutions and are really, like if vouchers go through, they're the ones who are really gonna be at risk of losing those schools. Um, and Jack is really the ed policy person of the two of us. So I'm sure he has something much <laughs> more, well, I won't say dry, just you go ahead. <laughs> um, no, I, I think that um, the only piece that I would add to that is to think about um, the federal level and how that might impact New Hampshire. And I think, as I mentioned earlier, I think there's an opportunity to rethink testing and accountability, um, which has really strongly shaped the work that schools and educators do um, for the past couple of decades. Um, it has also really shaped public perception of schools. I would imagine that New Hampshire is no exception uh, to this, where parents have truly come to believe that there is data that tells them that some schools are good and some schools are bad, um, and that they should, uh, you know, seek out these quote unquote good schools and avoid the quote unquote bad schools using only test scores as their evidence. Um, at this is, you know, deeply damaging uh, to communities. It exacerbates segregation. Um, it has all of these unintended consequences on school programming, right? Narrowing of the curriculum, um, practice testing, eating up an inordinate amount of instructional time. Um, you know, you all may have effectively resisted this better than educators in other places, um, but the national trends are very disconcerting and have been for a long time in terms of um, decreased number of minutes per day for um, just basic things like lunch and recess. Um, here across the border in Massachusetts, back when I used to send my daughter to school instead of into a closet with a laptop, um, she got <laughs> 15 minutes for lunch. Uh, and that included the time to stand in line and actually get the food in the cafeteria and 15 minutes for recess. Why? So that they could have more instructional time in math and reading. Um, this, of course, is only a feature of third grade and above because that's the first year that their test scores begin to matter. So I think there's a real opportunity here um, to think through federal accountability, the way that it impacts the states, the way that it impacts our schools, and to build a better way of talking about school quality and talking about how our schools are doing that reaffirms the broader mission of public education. Um, and that elevates the many aspects of schools that I think during this pandemic, parents have suddenly become acutely aware of, right? Like school is the place where my kid is happy. School is the place where my kid makes friends. At school, there are all of these adults other than me who my kid <laughs> trusts. Um, school is the place where my daughter learned how to play the violin. Um, school is the place where she figured out she's an artist, right? And she doesn't have a lot of that right now. Gym happens online and it's a disaster. And, and, and that's a problem because I don't know how to play these games that, uh, that her physical edu education teacher um, played with them and got them excited about. Um, I don't know how to teach her violin, right? So there are all of these things that we love about our public schools. And Jennifer mentioned um, rural communities. So often we talk almost exclusively about urban communities when we're having these big high level conversations about public education. Um, and rural communities get overlooked. Um, and I know that you have lots of rural schools in New Hampshire that are the heart of those communities. And so I think that, you know, it's absolutely important to be thinking about them as well as we're talking about this. Thank you. Um, we are really very hopeful. I mean, last year we had the Independent Commission for um, <clears throat> Fair School Funding that uh, went through our UNH Carsey School of uh, Research and came out with a report that's being largely ignored at this point, but it's there and the data is there. And we have um, certain grassroots organizations that are following that. And I think it will help us uh, through the future of trying to get some logical policies um, started. 
because the inequities, and of course we've got another lawsuit um, and that's always helpful. Um, uh, <clears throat> but the inequities in school funding in New Hampshire are just getting worse and worse and worse. Um, so as we kind of uh, wind into the end of this, um, what are some of the things that you can, uh, educators should feel most encouraged about right now moving forward and, and how can the association, uh, our local associations help uh, with all of this? Well, as we've gone into a little bit, I mean, I do think that people, for as, as much uh, turmoil as there is around reopening, I, I feel that people did come away with a better sense of what it is that teachers do. Um, there's also, you know, I've been following the reopening debate really closely, and I know this isn't as relevant as uh, in New Hampshire as it is in, in some other states, but there's a fascinating divide that has opened up. So poorer families and families of color, black and brown families, are the least comfortable sending their kids back to school right now because their communities have been hit so hard by COVID. And they also look at teachers unions now the most positively, um, as opposed to white parents, and especially the, the higher you go up the income bracket, the more hostile white families become to unions. And I thought, well, isn't this interesting? And, uh, and it makes a lot of sense, right? That if you're in a place where, like in our, for our podcast tomorrow, I interviewed a parent in New Orleans, and um, she said, you know, I wish that teachers would fight harder to keep schools closed right now, right? Like as she looks at it, the, uh, her child is vulnerable because her community is vulnerable. And so an organized voice saying, we're not just fighting for you, we're, we're not just fighting for our, our members and ourselves, we're fighting for you as well. That really resonates with her. And so one thing that I feel positive about, and I know it's early days, is what if this actually led to a realignment? When you think about all the damage that's been done in the country by pitting communities of color and unions against one another, um, what, you know, what if this led to some kind of a realignment? Um, and then, uh, so yeah, I'll leave it there. And Jack, what, what do you have to say? Uh, well, you kind of stole my, uh, <laughs> my focus there, Jennifer. That's, that's what I was uh, going to talk about. Um, I'll use a phrase that you didn't use. So you left scraps for me, and that's bargaining for the common good. <laughs> um, and we've seen over the past several years in the Red for Ed movement and others um, that when teachers make it really clear that they are out there advocating not just for themselves, but for kids and communities, um, suddenly people remember how much they like teachers. Um, that kind of cuts through the toxic rhetoric that we've been exposed to since about the year 2000, um, right? I'm, I, I'm almost having PTSD remembering Michelle Rhee on the cover of Time Magazine, <laughs> right? It's that ethos that has dominated the conversation about teachers and their unions. Uh, last night, somebody tweeted something about, you know, I'm hearing all of this negative stuff about how police unions are just blocking progress and keeping us from being able to uh, pursue racial equity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I would just like to remind people the teachers unions are the same. Um, and, and the fact is, is they're not because there's a big difference. And that is that whereas, uh, and this is not at all an attack on police, but just a very clear case of the, the difference between teaching and other professions is that um, police don't get into policing because they love the people who they interact <laughs> with the most, right? Um, they're trying to put those people in jail, right? But teachers get into their work precisely because they want to serve the people who they work with every single day. That's not an adversarial relationship. Um, we do see adversarial relationships between organized labor and the quote unquote client in lots of places. Um, we do see adversarial relationships between organized labor and the people who they interact with the most on a daily basis. That simply isn't true in education, right? Educators are motivated not by money 
um, not by you know this this false notion that uh, they're only working nine months a year. Um, they're motivated by the fact that they believe in what they're doing and they care about young people. And kids feel it. And when kids grow up, they become adults who remember that. It's just that sometimes the way we talk causes people to live in uh, a theoretical world in which teachers once organized become enemies rather than the real world in which teachers are our allies. Uh, they are um, key members of a democratic society. And the more that we can do to remind people of that, um, including the kinds of activism that teachers engage in, I think the more successful our public education system will be. I totally agree with the activism. I know when the Apple Corps showed up <clears throat> a few years ago up in the balcony in our state house with their red shirts on, uh, it made some people in the um, downstairs in the representatives hall feel very, very uncomfortable. Um, it was their teachers up there um, and it was hard for them to make the vote that they were going to make. Um, so we've taken all these lessons and and um, how do we how do we move them on to administrations and communities to ask for what we really need and what we really want? So the, there were a couple of questions in the chat that I oh, think okay. I'm sorry. kind of I didn't see well, the chat. but I think they kind of raised that. So okay, um, and I'll um, I'll helpfully read them because it okay. was, this is very <laughs> exciting to me. So somebody asked what might be um, effective ways to communicate in, with people in small towns where there's less media coverage now. And then the other person asked, how do we raise awareness about all these groups that are you know, pouring money into these causes? And so um, I would just say that one of the things that's so fascinating and frankly kind of funny about the stuff that's happening at the state level is that your crew in New Hampshire acts as though we don't know that there are these other states right and that you can actually go and look and see one like well what happened when arizona introduced education savings accounts how did that work out um and and a couple i'll point out a couple things about that is that edu uh, arizona is probably the state where these groups have the most aggressive presence and i would say that it's really started to backfire so first of all you know like they really drive the legislative agenda and so legislators keep pushing basically what your legislators are pushing, which is something that very few people in the state are asking for. And so after they rolled out universal vouchers, six moms got together and they forced the issue onto the ballot where Arizonans voted it down overwhelmingly. They didn't want vouchers. No one, vouchers, whenever they've been put up for a vote, always lose, right? People are deeply uncomfortable with the idea that public funds can go to fund schools that discriminate against kids, right? That's, that makes people really uncomfortable. So then the, this continues to play out in Arizona. And the next time the legislators went to make one of these, what Sununu would characterize as some small little program. How could you possibly complain about something that's meant to benefit just a handful of kids, right? The parents point out, well, if it's so small, why are representatives of all these national groups lobbying you at the state house? Why are they all here, right? And that really started to make people uncomfortable. And the last thing I would mention is that it's really worth taking a look at where this issue is playing out in other states right now, where they, the Republicans are taking advantage of the pandemic and the, con the consolidated legislative sessions and see how rural communities are responding. Look at what's happening in Iowa, because basically Republicans are having to push an agenda that's not in the interest of their own constituents, right? Like how do they, the rural people feel like they're, you know, we don't have private schools. Why are you, we, you know we're strapped for cash. Why are you rolling out something that's going to cut what the little we can offer our kids now, explain that to us. So I recommend taking a look at how this is playing out in other states and then using what's working in those states and just in putting it to work in New Hampshire. One thing that I'll add to this, um, we've been 
talking with lots of groups in lots of places. And um, I'm thinking of Texas uh, and a couple of groups that we've talked with there. Um, one is made up of parents, parents who just decided that they wanted to become advocates for public education in the San Antonio area. And um, they got themselves educated um, and they just lurk in blogs and chat rooms and all sorts of places, Facebook groups and correct the record. Um, they're there with, you know, information uh, rather than speculation. Uh, and uh, from what I can tell, they've been tremendously effective um, in terms of pushing back against sound bites that people might not understand um, to be what they really are, which would be, you know, policy attacks on public schools. Um, so I think connecting with parents, um, bringing parents into this and helping them understand how to talk to other parents about this and other members of their communities about this. Um, gives you much more reach here. And then um, this other group that we talked with today in Texas, um, this is, these are pastors who uh, are, you know, strong believers in public education, um, which is not to say that you all should go, you know, running out to the local houses of worship in all your different communities and um, try to connect with them exclusively. But it just, I think it points to the fact that civil society is not dead in this country. Um, you know, it's, it's been taking a beating for the last century, um, but there still are lots of civic organizations and civic minded organizations that believe in the public good and believe in the health and strength of communities. And I see that as a really strong triad there, uh, organized educators, um, parent activists and community groups working together to push back against disinformation so that when it comes time for um, people to vote on something, whether it be legislators who have been inundated by phone calls from teachers and parents and pastors and, uh, you know, bowling league members, um, uh, or if it's, you know, voters themselves turning up to vote on something, um, I think you know, there are, there are lots of opportunities to really leverage those kinds of relationships um, yeah. to place pressure on elected officials. We, um, just as a, a little anecdotal piece, uh, the other day we, we had a um, Bill 609, the Innovative School Bill, come, Schools of Innovations, uh, come before us, which is an Alex bill. And because we're now on Zoom, uh, one of the interesting things is that we always have this sign-in sheet at, at the state house where you can sh sign in either pro something or opposed to something and um, also testify. And because Zoom opens it up so people don't have to travel in bad weather, they don't have to travel miles to come to Concord, they can take a little break from their work and actually go on Zoom for a little bit. The um, sheet <laughs> for this particular bill 400 people voted or signed in as opposed to that bill versus five people pro the bill. Um, and it, I think it was such a surprise to the chair of our committee that uh, where I think they had planned on having an immediate vote on it, they delayed the vote, which is good because it just gives more time for more people to rally. But that's what I mean about really organizing your pens and your voices. Uh, and making them heard. That, that's what's really important this year because our hands are kind of tied um, and you will give us the bigger hands to reach out. So please be behind us. We really need that. Um, I think we're kind of coming to the end of the, of the time period right now. And I just want to say, um, kind of turn it over to uh, Brian Hawkins, who's um, one of our lobbyist for NEA and we see his smiling face down in the state house when I'm down there and get calls now. So take it away, Brian. Thanks, Linda. And thank you, uh, Jennifer and Jack. Uh, that was terrific. Um, I know I'm, I'm inspired for this uh, um, battle we're about to uh, be in for the next five months here in New Hampshire. Um, and, uh, and thank you, Linda, for all the work that you're doing. I see a number of uh, our friends in the legislature who are also um, on the call and listening, thank you for everything that you're doing. Um, as, as timing would have it, um, 
the number one priority uh, that has been uh, put forward, uh, the, the voucher bill, House Bill 20, uh, is, is go, was uh, scheduled for next Tuesday. Um, and as Linda said, it, it is much more difficult in this pandemic to have that terrific face-to-face -face, uh, conversation that we would normally be used to. But one of the silver linings of that is you don't have to drive to Concord um, to make your voice heard at a hearing, um, which is coming up, as I said, um, this Tuesday at 1.15 in the House Education Committee. Um, and I know a lot of those 400 people who signed in were NEA New Hampshire members, uh, AFT members, um, people who really understand uh, the value of public education. And so uh, we're gonna ask you to do it again, um, except do it even bigger. Um, we need to make our voices, as, as Jack and Jennifer said, uh, loud and clear um, about uh, the value of uh, public education and, um, and, and exactly what um, going down this road of what has been analyzed to be the most expansive voucher program proposed in the entire country being put forward here in New Hampshire. So we'll be um, uh, sending out um, uh, some, some points, um, an alert about this. Um, I can go ahead and um, put the link uh, to sign up in the chat. Um, for, uh, for signing in. All you have to do is pick the date, February 2nd, in the calendar when you go there. Pick the time and bill, which is House Bill 20 at 1.15. Um, and then it kind of it guides you as to whether you're opposed or in, in support. And certainly if you have the time, um, we would love to have you there to, to actually speak um, if you can't be there, please uh, just uh, follow the prompts, sign in in opposition. Um, as I said, we will be uh, sending out uh, an alert um, for the weekend to make sure you, uh, so when, you, when, when, you, uh, when, you, when, you, when you're on your weekend uh, or before you leave uh, um, school for, uh, for, for the weekend, Please talk to your colleagues, your fellow members about this, spread the word um, and help us uh, defeat this bill. Um, it's gonna be a long fight, but um, with everybody here, we'll, um, you know, we have a volunteer legislature um, and there are votes out there um, that you know, with constituent influence, um, you know, we can be successful. So thank you. Uh, would you like to see what that looks like, everyone? I mean, I can share the screen with you quickly if you okay. want to see how that works. Or is everybody good? You can also send in written testimony. If yes. You go to the you. general court website, look under standing committees, and go down to the education committee. You can actually email all the members uh, and give a short personal story, please. We get so many cookie cutter emails, like on this one, um, I've already started getting cookie cutter emails from the national organizations that, that get people to send them in. So um, personal stories are really great. How it's gonna affect you or your, or your children or other children. All right, so real quick, I did hear from a, a number of people. So this, this, is, this is what the screen, if you go to sign in, um, as opposed to a bill, literally, Brian was saying you pick the 2nd of February, scroll down to House Education Committee, it's HB 120, the bill is at 115, select an option, you are a member of the public representing yourself, and you would oppose the bill. If you want to testify, you would click here. If you do not want to testify, that's okay. You just follow the rest of the prompts to um, be put into um, the system. And as we found out earlier, uh, we have found that this, this is a great way for our, our members to get involved and actually be put on record in, in overwhelming numbers. We're also looking for uh, folks to, to uh, 
you know, have some deeper conversations with their, uh, some of their legislators that need convincing. Um, and we're going to be putting some of those venues together over the next few weeks. And so uh, if you're interested in that, I put my email in the chat. Hope you'll reach out and uh, keep, keep uh, an eye on our legislative bulletins that go out every week. And if you have a few extra dollars left from the $600 um, money from the federal government, the Apple Corps is a great place to put a few dollars in. Um, like I said, when they wear those red shirts at the state house, some people get very nervous. So is that a wrap for tonight, um, Brian and Megan? Okay, thank you all for coming. Thank you, uh, Jennifer and Jack. It was a wonderful evening. The book's great. Um, I would encourage everybody to buy it. I, I have a copy and um, it, was a, it was a long read, but a very welcome read. <laughs> so thank you. And Thanks, everybody. everybody. Thanks for having us. Good night, everybody. Good night.